Oh, I'll, sh I'll show you. This is my crown. Oh, oh great. <laughs> I went and got one. Peter asked me. I thought, I'm about it. Do you think? Oh, and, nice. I at her and I said, hmm, <laughs> You're like, should I play her? I don't know. Because I did take some time to decide. But uh -huh. I, so I was tossing around. But anyway. <laughs> your gongs and your bongs for all the men to whom it matters so much. But I'd be lying if I didn't admit to having done a little thinking in view of how well it all went. Uh, about us doing it more often. Doing what? Sharing duties. But we didn't share duties, you just went to a dinner party. In your place. And represented crown and country with I think we can agree, favorable results. Isn't it possible that we've stumbled upon something here? You have far too much to do, far too much pressure, far too much responsibility, and I too little. Having no role, having nothing to do, is soul destroying. All I'm asking is if you were prepared to share a little more. For both our sakes. Welcome all the way from England here, I think. All the way from England. I'm staggered that I've managed to achieve this technical bridge <laughs> to, to join these uh, meetings. It's quite, it's an extraordinary thing. Yeah, it's I a whole new world. That. It is a whole new world. Yeah. And I get fascinated by other people's private houses and all those yeah. books you've got. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? A lot of movie books here. I'm sure you're in half of them uh, from, from many of the movies you've made. I could go on and on listing them. Uh, right now, uh, we're, we're talking about a current role you're doing, uh, Princess Margaret in The Crown in the uh, third and I believe the fourth season. You've shot both of them already, haven't you? Or, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we're technically finished. We managed to just finish the last season just before lockdown happened. In fact, they had one more week, but principally most of us had finished. So it was the end of um, basically a two-year job. So two six-month, seven-month shoots over a two-year period. Um, and it's over. It was, it was so rushed because of lockdown. We didn't have a proper end, and there were lots of things we didn't do. Usually we like as in season three we were afforded a time where we could go back and reshoot stuff um that won't happen this time so um it already seems quite distant margaret but it was a real um this job was on many ways like no other and will never be bettered in some ways because of so many different things one being the sheer time it takes just to have the opportunity to live with somebody for so long yeah is uh, you can't really beat time. Um, there was one time I remember Peter said, this read through for season four, he said, he much would say, God, all of you are so much better now than last season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, of course we are, because we're, we're not overthinking it. You know, we've been with these people for six months, we took a break, and then we're back. And none of us are going, Oh, we got to, you know, you're, you're so in search of a character and you over, you overdo things. You're acting like a maniac. You're terrified too, because it's a long way down. You're very conscious that it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a high, particularly when you're following people who've done very, very well too. Yeah. Uh, you've got lots of ghosts on your shoulder, not only the previous, like Vanessa and, and um, Claire, but the actual, you know, Margaret and Queen on your shoulder. So, so, but it, the second season, it was almost like, ah, oh, they we were more settled in ourselves and because um, I think we trusted ourselves better, more. I think it's fascinating the way this series is being done. You mentioned Vanessa. She did the first two seasons, the younger Margaret. You're doing the middle part. Uh, and then we have an actress that's coming in to do the later part. Uh, I haven't quite heard of that before in television. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's a great idea, and it, it's enjoyable for um, the audience. And I love the way Pete introduced Olivia 
in particular or the whole new cast this time and it was a wink it was saying look you know and it was letting everybody into the absurdity that somehow when you're young you're claire and then given 10 years you suddenly become olivia you know <laughs> and, but it also says a lot about the fact it's like doing a play you know a play is played you have the same part played by many many actors and because of the it's a complex enough part and in some ways ultimately unknowable because we will never know what they're truly like it's, it gives license for all these different people and different types of actors to have a go at their Margaret, at their Queen, at their Philip. Um, and uh, I think it gives you new blood. And I love the fact that ultimately Pete said, you know, you cannot act old. You can superficially, you can add some, you know, some latex and whatever. But the inside beatings, the dents in one's heart and the sadness and the just experience of having been alive uh for longer he said you can't act you can't act bitterness he said <laughs> <laughs> and i love the fact that we were being paid to be old you know there's so much in this profession and frankly i think in throughout the world i mean just in every day like, we, we're we're sort of being taught that old you know aging is obviously the big taboo and we must you know do everything to avoid any kind of sign whatsoever and here we were trying to you know here we were positively encouraged to embrace our our age so it was um it was a great job i knew i as i was doing it it was never going to be i'll tell you another reason why it's never as good as it I, it's as good as it gets um it's just so well produced yeah i've been on many many films over my years and this is so expertly produced and it has to be said there's so much money but it's not in excess it's done and it's put to getting the job done better so if there's a problem, then they bring in more people. There's so many young people ready to learn too. And um, really everyone's top of the game, the DOP, the directors, the writing obviously is where it starts and that's the foundation. And we're only as good or as funny or as clever or as intelligent as Pete, frankly, Morgan. Um, and also I do think Morgan particularly likes Margaret. So I think I've always had, I've had the benefit of that, that relationship. And interesting enough, they have the same initials, like I said. I've spotted that PM. We call everyone talks about Peter Morgan. He never really appears. He's beavering away in a. <laughs> he's know, the, yeah. Peter Morgan. Yeah. Peter Morgan. Yeah, he's, he's really. Yeah, it's his. Yeah. Uh, and this is calm. And I love also the way he created it because it came. It's like the parent. He keeps on different different projects that he create parent other ones so he'd started off with the queen with Helen Mirren. then he went into the audience and in, in you know in researching the audience he realized there's there's a television series here you know there's a dynastic series so um he's fascinating and i thank i'm grateful to every little gray muscle he has which he has a lot of <laughs> uh you have one advantage here you actually knew margaret you uh and you're you're yeah. all actually uh, used to uh, go out with her, right? <laughs> uphemism, yes, it's, it covers a lot of um, areas of behavior, go out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, American term here. <laughs> go out with English too, we go out with somebody. Um, um, I, I wouldn't say I, I knew her, but I, I mean, I was, I met her a few times and she was at my uncle's parties when I was very young. And I was aware that they had been, um, they'd gone out when they were young. And they were my friends. And um, I remember being so excited when I was young, going, oh my God, there's a princess in the room. And we were always made aware that just remember, don't turn your back on her. She doesn't like that. And she's tiny. You know, she was very, very small, which was a liability for her because people would bump into her. And um, it wasn't immediately obvious that she was there. And there was a lot to be said that, you know, one of her things is, she was tiny and that governed uh, her behavior, I think, a lot. So so I met her, and at one point she did say, and I did think it's funny looking back on it, I met her at, um, I think it was the reopening of Windsor, which had been burnt down, and they invited lots of actors and people from the arts to celebrate the refurbishment. And she was standing there with a drink and looking sort of on her own, you know, and then she did say, Helen, oh, yes, she recognized me. Yes, you are getting better at acting, aren't you? And um, <laughs> I thought, looking back on it, I thought, wow, you're going to be so grateful that I'm getting better because, you know, it was in the hands of my lack of talent or increasing talent that I, you know, she was ultimately. Uh, 
to it. But um, it, that was a typical statement too, and I think she was quite like that. That's quite idiomatic of her, and that she would compliment you and put you down at the same time. You didn't quite know what where you stood. It's amazing. What do you think she'd think of this? Since you did have some uh, idea of the way she looked at people and. Uh... I think she'd have immense fun. I think she had a lot of, and I think the Queen does too, from what I gather. They will have a huge sense of um, uh, take things with a lot of salt. They have a huge sense of, do you say that in America, a pinch of salt? Uh, a lot yes, yes. Of, you know, they have, um, I can't think of something, like, um, they have a very big sense of humor. And uh, I think they would have enjoyed it. And they would have, she would have enjoyed it, I think, because it is very positive about her. I think she was genuinely a bit pissed off about being so negatively um, pursued in the press, and she was. She had a narrative, but she was also wise enough to realize that's how the press worked, and that's also partly why um, what they're there for is the royal family is to provide narrative you know, in the press, and it's actually not necessarily anything to do with one's own private life. Um, it's very tough, though, particularly in England with the tabloids. I mean, they're relentless and uh, have been yeah, known for that. Yeah, you don't look at a tabloid for um, your sense of self-esteem or any. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't Google or tweet or anything. If you're well known, don't go there. It's no point. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's more about them than it does about you. You know, people need to take you down. It makes them feel better. It's that, oh, my mom's a psychotherapist and she, you know, it's, I think it's Adler. You know, his theory is that, or somebody that you, you basically start on a negative people and, and in order to feel positive about themselves, they put other people down. It's a, just a normal psychological pattern. It's very fickle. You know, sometimes you're, you're, um, com you know, complimented and sometimes you're totally torn apart, but it doesn't really matter. And I've long given up taking it seriously. When you're young, it's a different thing. I think when you're done, young, it's, it's more tricky and when you're vulnerable too. What was the most surprising thing you personally learned about Margaret in in playing her? Because I know you as an actor are really into research, really like want to know everything. I even read that you went to an astrologer to get some information on her too, or some some. Uh, yeah, no, I think a lot of it's anxiety and terror and the responsibility, particularly with somebody so well known. So I feel it's my responsibility and also just to keep my anxiety at bay to know absolutely everything. And then probably use about 5%. But I will read every single book. It's like I was a SWAT at school and now a SWAT meaning somebody who works ridiculously hard. And I, it's gone straight into my, and I've got files on Margaret. I've got a book, of, I could show you the box and, and ridiculous notes and notes and it's so anal it's it's actually scary i get quite insane and a lot of it is but then a lot of it is just my curiosity because i want to not only suspend my own disbelief that i'm playing somebody else <laughs> the whole thing with acting is like who are we trying to kid but also my curiosity i want to just i feel like i'm sometimes um, a bit of a shirt. I like to think I'm Sherlock Holmes, sifting through the evidence, trying to work out the core bits that make this person behave like how they do. And you do a lot of there all these different things. And you read the biographies, but you can read, you know, inches of biographies. Like, I mean, and of course, the more famous the person, the more lucid they can be. Um, the astrologer friend is a very clever lady who always seems to and i don't know how how astrology works and i know that a lot of people are very cynical and of course we poo it but she's uncannily accurate about certain things and so she'll say there's certain things that because ultimately what you try and do is distill it into certain actions that and certain governing ideas behind her and the one thing that crops up with margaret a lot of the time is her which is very unsuitable for being royal, is that she tends to say exactly what's in her head, which is a filter, which is, makes her exciting and dangerous. And right. not, you know, and that, you know, it's always like a cannon in the room. And that's kind of also useful dramatically because she says everything that everyone's pretending not to say, or it's, there, there's no decorum, there's a lack of decorum. But then the next minute, then she'll recede. But she will say so, but that apparently is very much in her star sign. It's very specific my my great friend Darby who does it and she um so there's certain things and then I go the things 
if I take a character, and I'll always do somebody who I, who's real, if I've got a real, then, and then like, you correlate between all the different, all the facts, and she gives me some real things, you're like, ah, oh, yes. She was extraordinary, she said, I mean, her brain was extraordinary. Margaret was a very clever woman. She, uh, there were lots of things now, of course, it was, it's now 18 months since I saw Darby. But I have also a very clever aunt who's a graphologist, who's in New York, who's 90 now. And she still does, and she analyzes people's handwriting. So I'll always send her people's handwriting. And again, between Darby, that witch, my, and uh, my aunt, I get wow. so information. It's fascinating. <laughs> that is cool. And not only, it's that everybody obviously changes and evolves through their life. So you get a whole passage. She was brilliant. With, like, the Queen Mother I played, for instance, um, years ago and I didn't have much time to do my prep and so I, I had enough time to read William Shawcross's biography but it was very reverential I mean a royal is a royal which means that if the authorized thing you're not going to get underneath um, and Ron Arter got her like in two pages I got the relationship she said this the dynamic between the queen mother and um, and the father. And I think with me, with Margaret, <laughs> I'm still taking it very personally, with me, she <laughs> never <laughs> problematic with my family. <laughs> <I don't, yeah. laughs> um, <laughs> with me, Margaret, she never really recovered from the death of her father. And the, Margaret is definitely the father's daughter. I think the queen and the queen mother were very much in that foursome, and they were a very tight foursome before everything changed, and that abdication changed the whole, their, everybody, in their whole lives, apart from the country. But um, the queen and the queen mother had the same kind of um, disposition, whereas I think Margaret and um, Bertie, she inherited, he was the one who stammered, the king's speech. So he, yeah. she inherited that anxiety. And if you've got an internal anxiety, and, and I think a disposition to depression, the queen mother I, I, and the queen, I don't think they've ever been depressed for a second. They've been sad, but they've never had a mental illness. I think the queen, I think both the, and this is my feeling, Margaret definitely had depression and she got that anxiety. I also from, I think genet genetically possibly from, from the father. That's so interesting. Of course, you have the app opportunity here to play both the mother and the daughter. You mentioned uh, and referenced the King's Speech for which you were nominated for an Academy Award. And uh, and that's that's an unusual kind of opportunity for an actor to... It was. <laughs> it was. It's funny. Ultimately, you're playing you know, also different things. You go roaming around finding the real queen, the queen mother, and then ultimately you have to play uh, Peter Morgan's The Crown version. Um, for instance, things like this, the rivalry between those two sisters is really played to the hilt in the crown. Right. Uh, the rivalry, there was possibly an early rivalry, but really, um, and I think we bring that more into it, season four, the closeness of their, and their real, um, real dependence um, and alliance between their sisters. They become closer, but things happen in their lives and different, they meet on, and you get a glimpse of it at the end of season three in that scene um, between when the queen comes to her and says, you are the most important person in my life. And she needs, all she needs to hear is that because she feels so redundant. But there was one point when me and Olivia, I think the first day actually that I was on and we're sitting there, so Marion is fantastic. I mean, absolutely great. And I didn't want to mention the fact you do realize we've all played your character. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, one thing the Queen Mothers always do is that you're sitting like that, you're like, like that. <laughs> always had her head. She, well, not obviously, I don't think a private, but as soon as she was in public, she said, I'm low status and I'm lovely, you know. And I, and um, who was it? Noel Coward. That was the nugget that gave me my. I remember it was like she was marshmallow covered in steel, you know. So she had this fluffy thing, but ultimately, absolutely steely and quite ruthless. Amazing. You, yeah. No, but it was. It is a privilege to to get to know a family and all that's handed down the baggage and who carries the baggage and it's a complicated as. And that's the thing, every flipping family is complicated, and that's the success of the crown. You've got an ordinary family with all those complications, and then on top of it, the fact that there's a, you know, a flipping royal family who have the head of a state and symbol. I mean, I think that's the other thing is 
you know, I was before I sort of played or even thought about the not the show, I always go like, can't you just have some imagination and change the hairdos for fuck's sake? You know, I don't mean to say fuck's sake, but you know what I mean. And of course, then having played Margaret, I didn't felt the Queen Mom, but it was more in the crown. The thing is, you're not your duty is you're a symbol. You're a walking symbol, an institution. You're not a human. You represent something. So the point is, you must be always instantly recognisable. And Margaret, you know, she stayed with the helmet head, which I think Princess Anne, you know, she inherited. And um, there's also something funny about Margaret, you know, thing, little things, because she was literally only five foot tall. She had the car, her seat of her car raised. So she was visible. The only job. Well, you know, the, the other thing is also when you play somebody incredibly well known, the only way you get any kind of rub of the person or a sense of how they are or, or how they lived or what they were like is to go to the great friends. So they were fantastically generous and I would go. And what was the great thing? Because I think Margaret was, everyone loved to hate Margaret. She's, she definitely had a bad rap while she was alive but boy was she loved and so many people all those friends really missed her and i could tell because they were so ready to put the record right and also wanted to bring her back in the room you know and talk about her and talk about all these different facets that no one would ever know because that wasn't her job either but she was fantastically interested she was brilliantly talented she was had this sort of you know musical um i think she had a she you know she'd listen to something could play it and um she was very well read. She had no pity either. They cast her in as this, you know, the cart the I think people thought, oh, poor drunk person and right. uh, Addiction. tragic. Yeah. She had no sense, I don't think, at all, a sense of feeling tragic, you know. She had a lovely life. Yeah. How does she compare to all, you know, when I mentioned uh, that you've been in a lot of things that people have seen, you have you have done so many different kinds of movies and things and, and uh, you know planet of the apes fight club sweeney todd alice in wonderland uh harry potter has to have brought you uh, i i'm wondering of all the roles you played what do people want to talk to you most about when they see you when 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 they meet you i think what do they want to talk to me about i think oh it depends on the person it depends on the generation you know and sometimes it's really un unlikely because it usually you see like there was an older lady once, not that long ago, who sort of was approached. I could see that the recognition, you know, you can see somebody beaming in. And, <laughs> and, and as they're coming, you just in your head go, oh, well, she's going to be a merchant ivory, you know. Right, room with a view. You're going to go down that thing. And then, in fact, it was, I loved You Are My Favourite Film. Fight Club. How <laughs> <laughs> like, great is that? She loved so, Marvel. <laughs> She was, you know, about 80 odd, very, very sort of beautifully upper class British in Hampstead, loved Fight Club. Um, <laughs> so I love that. Then you have the odd, um, really cool, you know, in their 20s boys who were freaked out by seeing me because, of course, when Harry Potter came out, I was a psychotic person. Uh, but they still have that inner child that goes, oh, fuck, you know. <laughs> All of the different reactions, it's a very, you just don't really know what they're going to, what people are wanting to talk about. But what's, you know, it's not my doing. I didn't make these films, but I, I'm so lucky to have featured in the imaginations of all these people, but very different kinds of imaginations. And, you know, there's absolutely no consistency to my career whatsoever. <laughs> but that's very like me, because I like changing things up, and I'm curious, and I like, um, you know, something that makes me want to do a job is is one the talent because you're only going to be as good as that person. You're completely at the prey of their their talent. The words are absolutely vital, or not. Sometimes you'll go and do a job because you know, like Planet of the Apes. I didn't do it because of the script. I think it's a <laughs> you know, and I knew that the script was really not in good shape. And even Richard Zanuck, who was in a, ended up being a good friend, he said. On the first day, I said, Richard, you know, we're watching all these armies of people coming up for the first day of shoot. We've been up, I've been up since 1.30. I was a chimpanzee. It took me four hours. Uh -huh. come a I was watching all these people come up and go like, the operation is military to get this whole crew and all these gorillas and all these chimpanzees, about 200 extras up onto this mountain. And I go like, but the foundation, and there was me and Dick, who's the most modest and the most amazing man 
and he'd arrived with his own little stool up and I'd climbed up in my, my chimp outfit. <laughs> I said, this is an amazing you know, operation. And in the script, you know, the script could be a bit, I didn't really know, you know, it could be a bit better. I mean, the dialogue, I said, no, nah, that'd still be a hit. That's why we employ you guys. <sighs> but, but don't you want, because the costume, the set, the thing, it's all, if the script ain't there, anyway. It didn't seem to matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. So, it didn't Do matter. You have a, a personal favorite uh, of all these uh, people that are, probably still live inside you in one way or another? <laughs> I will say that the other benefit of the job is that, that people linger and then they stay on and then they also definitely, um, you know, rub off on you. So um, when they come back, Elizabeth Taylor was really good fun. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I played her in a small thing for television and, and boy, was she a big thing in the small television. <laughs> she was <laughs> such a fun person to have around. Uh, she was similar in a way to Margaret in the sense that she wasn't, both Margaret and Elizabeth had amazing sense of humor. You know, yeah. They were really, really funny. Um, and very clever, too. Um, but favorite people, you could, that's just like choosing a favorite child. You can't. You know. <laughs> I, I know. I look at your lineup of, of films and things you've done and stage and everything. I don't know how you'd pick one, but it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a career uh, when you look back oh, at yeah. it. I mean, I've never actually taken much. I do it because I love it. I've never taken myself very seriously. I take the job seriously, very seriously. But now um, I'm really having getting better and better. I think I'm about to be uh, possible, you know. And I think <laughs> <laughs> I get, you know, it's like yes, I know I can do this. And I, but also, I've managed to meet so many people. That's the best. There's so many great things about this job. If you keep on working, the amount of people that you meet, and in different countries, and the different because um, if you in normal career you just you know if you're a doctor's office or or any you know your your realm is very small. But the problem then is then you never have any certainty. I've no idea what I'm going to be doing in the next six months. And of course, like every single self-employed person, you go like, oh, is this it? Um. I go by my gut. You just know. It's like meeting someone falling in love or you like somebody. You meet them on the page, you go, that's it. There's usually no, de no decision. Thankfully, I've aged at a time where aging is in. You know, I can honestly say that there's such complexity, and mostly because of television being such a big thing now. Is that yeah. it's, the, you know, it's the medium where you can develop character, and it's about character. People love watching uh, character-driven stories. You know, it's great. And we're allowed to be old, you know. So, um, I that, wasn't, yeah. that wasn't possible before for in, in Hollywood. It really wasn't. And now it seems like it is a golden era again for actresses, in particular. It seems. I think. I think for all of us, because when I was younger, like when I started off about thirty years ago, the writing, the level of writing for both men and women was pretty bad. I felt. I felt it was not. It was not terribly. I mean, it's not. Not for everyone, but I did think, well, it, the stereotyping was terribly unimaginative. And it was like, you, if you were young, you had to be good looking. It's like, there was no chance for having any kind of anomaly or just been, I remember being like, I'm not going to work in Hollywood because I didn't have six foot legs. My legs aren't thin or my butt. It was all like, and every single part I was up for had, was described in terms of what they looked like. And it was always, you had to be sexy and beautiful. And it was just, <laughs> play and I think that's why my friend actually Lily's out is another great friend of Dick's thing said like you became a character actress way before you needed to well I did become a chimp yeah and I said <laughs> because I knew that I've always been a character actor because that's where all the interest was and playing someone who you can put together I'm sure it's not that far away linked from what my mum does with psychotherapists is that I love working out people and um, working out how they work the definition of acting right there. Uh, when are we going to see uh, season four of uh, The Crown? Do you know? <laughs> I don't either. Well, we have season three right now. <laughs> no, we don't know anything. I mean, it was originally planned, I think, in November, wasn't it? They tend to do it so that people can sit down to their Thanksgiving and then they can... 
Ah. So I don't know if things are going to be changed, but I, I, I think they'll, they'll be ready. I mean, the thing is, everyone's been editing like a, yeah. and it's been an amazing season this time because it's with Diana comes in, and she's played by an extraordinary actress called Emma Corrin, and and then you have Satcha, who is extraordinary too, played by Gillian Anderson. Oh, yeah. uh, so you've got these two great women threading uh, and their stories. So, I mean, I pop in for one episode, one big episode, but it's a really good episode, um, episode seven. Otherwise, I'm I'm just, you know, that's what was fun. It's a lot of the time you ship up for work and you really not have to act that much. <laughs> 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 you have Olivia, who's great company, who hates my music taste. You know, it was a long day. You ship up at about five, you get the whole thing. You, you emerge three hours later with the hair, the makeup, the da da da. And then you have nice chats to buy everyone, honestly, the kindest and funnest and great crew. And and then it would be like, you know, somebody's funeral, Winston Churchill's funeral, or. Um, the wedding or the rehearsal for the wedding or the thing there's so many group scenes where you are basically an extra which is fun and fine and it's um it's been a really great job i've been so grateful that um peter thought that i was right to play the old the old marge and boy was he right well thank you so much for joining us uh today all the way from england here to uh to where we are in la uh for the actors Oh, I'll, sh I'll show you. This is my crown. Oh, oh great. I <laughs> went and got one. Peter asked me. I thought, oh, I'm about it. Do you think? Oh, and, nice. I it and I said, hmm, <laughs> You were like, should I play her? I don't know. Because I did take some time to decide. But <laughs> I, so I was tossing around. But anyway, <laughs> I didn't think so, even though apparently it's um. It's the other actress who's a great actress. Yes. <laughs> I know she me up. No, so. <laughs> Thanks so much. Helena Bottom Carter. Thank you. Nice to see you, Pete. So nice to chat. You too. <laughs>